beginning, there was Alien. I think they thought they were going to make a sci-fi with a monster in some cardboard box tunnels. Originally, it had been an all-male story, and that they'd kind of arbitrarily just said, well, let's take the lead maker a woman, because no one will expect that to happen. But you never had a real idea of what the whole monster looked like. You began to see another world, another, oh, well, a nightmare, a living nightmare in front of you. Move, get out of there. Move, you move. Move, now, get out. Then came aliens. Look, I'm telling you, there's something moving and it ain't us. There's something very kind of very deep rooted psychological feeling about this monster. It's a fear that's almost primordial. The sight of that face hugger just scampering towards Sigourney was really frightening, even as an actor. Fear is a, is, a, is a very strong reaction. It makes people realize that they're alive. To me, the ultimate scene is when the cargo bay door opens, Sigourney is in the power loader, and the queen alien is threatening the little girl, Newt. from her, you bitch! The Queen was a living work of art that performed. She was a state-of-the-art puppet. Come on! Come on! I didn't want to be in a science fiction picture, but I I thought, God, you know, this is, this is a really interesting woman. I've never seen a woman in a picture like this. The bottom line is you're there to scare the living daylights out of the audience. Outside London, on the lot of world-famous Pinewood Studios, Sigourney Weaver, director David Fincher and crew worked toward completion of the new movie that would take an already classic series to yet another level. The movie is Alien 3, and in the tradition of its two highly successful predecessors, Alien and Aliens, it's making the next leap in the science fiction genre. Hey, Fred, come on, let's go! Let's go, wait! Reprising her role as Officer Ellen Ripley, Sigourney Weaver prepares once again to face the alien. She lands on a little planet that's a, a former prison, and uh, she's rescued, but the people that she's escaped with are, have not survived, so essentially she has to begin all over again. In Alien 3, Sigourney Weaver plays against a backdrop of all male characters, some not so happy to see her. <laughs> This is uh, an abandoned maximum security prison. And all the inhabitants of uh, this place are sort of the wretched of the universe. What's her medical status? She doesn't seem too badly damaged. She's unconscious. I can't give you a more specific diagnosis at the moment. Will she live? I would think so. I am a prison doctor with a past of um, alcohol and drug abuse for which I served my time. And now I'm on the staff. Because basically nobody would employ me anywhere else. Into our environment comes a woman doing and saying some very strange things. So that's intriguing. Look, I'm on your side. I want to help, but I need to know what's going on. 
or what you think is going on. If you really want to help, find me a computer with audio capability so I can access this flight recorder. We don't have anything like that here. Lance Henriksen from Aliens returns in his role as Bishop the Android. Superintendent Andrews, who's in charge of the uh, Wayland Utani Work Correctional Unit on Fury 161, which is the name of this planet. Let me see if I have this correct, Lieutenant. It's an eight foot creature of some kind with acid for blood, and it arrived on your spaceship. It kills on sight and is generally unpleasant. And of course, you expect me to accept all this on your word. No. I don't expect anything. Quite a story, Mr. Aaron. Right, sir. It's a beauty. Ralph Brown plays Assistant Superintendent Aaron, nicknamed 85. So, um, David. Yeah. You can get these drums organized and... Uh, right, 85. And, uh, don't call me that. This is 85 thing. A couple of us sneaked a look at his personnel file the day he arrived. It's his IQ. He doesn't really necessarily believe her. He thinks she's being a bit paranoid now. Maybe she's some sort of, you know, intergalactic terrorist anyway who's trying to destroy the company. I'm trying to find out why we crashed. And I'm tortured by the idea, it may be paranoia or not, I don't know, that we might have brought an alien with us. We have to do an autopsy. What? I told you. We have to make sure how she died. It is Ripley's story. She is, and she's a classic heroine. And she, she really pulled it off. I mean, it was, it was her, the first one was kind of her debut, but the second one, a lot of people don't remember uh, that she was nominated for an Academy Award for Best Actress. Well, I bet Casey doesn't have scary dreams. Let's take a look. Nope, nothing bad in there, see? Maybe you could just try to be like her, hmm? Ripley, she doesn't have bad dreams because she's just a piece of plastic. Right. <laughs> I'm sorry, Nika. You think, well, okay, here's Ripley again, fighting the alien. But uh, you're going to be swept away by Ripley in this film, even more so than the first two. <laughs> And you watch some of the playbacks on the video, and uh, you think, Jesus, she's got a lot of a talent, a lot of technique. I think she was always clearly defined as uh, being someone with a slight, initially, superiority complex, um, who then, you know, has to grasp and grapple with reality and survival. I don't think of her as this brave, strong person. I think that women in general are incredibly strong. I just think of her as an ordinary person who is thrust into these extraordinary circumstances. From the alien spaceship in the first movie to the nest on planet LB-426 in the second movie, artist H.R. Giger has redefined the look of the future. The sets themselves were a recreation pretty much of Giger's artwork, his mind, his vision. My paintings always look like plans for, for three-dimensional things. So uh, it was, in a way, close to do something for a movie. And uh, I think the movie uh, this century is more important than, than paintings. To me, the anchor to all the three movies is Geiger. I honestly believe that a little bit of Geiger will transform you inside. Well, I think each film of the Alien series has not been what people think the future is going to be. I mean, after 2001, everyone thought everything was going to be like that, and Ridley, in fact, made it sort of down and dirty. And um, Cameron kept to that tradition to a certain extent, you know, the, the roughness of space. 
famed British production designer Norman Reynolds provides the design expertise to the sets of Alien 3. This set really has evolved over a period of time. It's in the future, yet it has a lot of the, uh, the present and, and some of the past in it too. The trick, I think, really for me, or the difficulty has been, which is part of this uh, challenge, is, is to make the thing look interesting, not overtly sort of science fiction, but to, to give it a look of its own. One of David's uh, thoughts was he, what he was looking for was something where you could throw in a bucket of water and just pose the place down, the entire planet. It seems that it's kind of consistent with the other two in that it's, you know, uncomfortable and dark and claustrophobic and, you know, this kind of, you know, the same kind of motif like, you know, liquid and acid and, um, you know, hostile. This movie is so gothic uh, in terms of the setting, the, the, the sets. This is, the, this is the most gothic place I've ever been. I've never seen anything like the set. This uh, set here is the ventilation shaft set. And this is uh, the alien seems to like getting down in these little corridors and ductings and hiding away. And anyone who has anything to do with that uh, particular scene needs a storyboard. It's a way of communicating to everybody what the director's wishes are. Spikey! You found it. The unique visual style in the settings of all three alien movies certainly changed the look of science fiction forever. But the most unforgettable contribution to the nightmares of the audience is its namesake. H.R. Gigi's futuristic lithographs of a biomechanical creature were just the inspiration director Ridley Scott needed for Alien. His whole idea was that the thing had such a short life and it would get darker, the skin would start to get darker as it progressed because it was bruising. And that's why its obsession with having to lay its seed so that it could reproduce because it knew that it wouldn't have a long enough lifespan. Director Jim Cameron and producer Gail Ann Hurd had a different approach in Aliens. We came up with the idea that it could be analogous to a termite or a bee colony or hive. Um, and that allowed for the fact that there could be not only a life cycle that had three different factors, but also the idea that there was the biggest, baddest alien of all was the Queen Mother. Now in Alien 3, David Fincher and Sigourney Weaver have the chance to further the evolution of the alien and come up with new ways to terrorize and thrill alien fans. So I want to go back to the mystery of having one alien, which Fincher had already decided to do, but he he did want a creature that we'd never seen before, this thing that moves so fast and is so voracious and destructive that it's just blinding. Special effects designers Alec Gillis and Tom Woodruff, along with visual effects creator Richard Edland, worked closely with David Fincher to bring the next generation alien to life. Giger designed the alien for the first picture it, under, it underwent a little bit of a transformation when Cameron did Aliens. And now Fincher doing Alien 3, it underwent yet another little transformation. He kept referring to it as a, uh, a freight train crossed with a Jaguar. You know, it's just something that was just fast and killing and, and it, would always, it would always get its prey. And they play with it or toy with it a little bit, but ultimately back, never come back empty handed from any kind of a confrontation. forced us to create a, a technology to handle Fincher's demands. We came up with this technique called Mo Motion, which involves a motion-controlled robotic camera that you can quickly set up on the stage and shoot on the sets, and then you can put the alien as a separately photographed creature into another scene. We have a head that uh, we call our attack head, which 
is a uh, pneumatically controlled device that fires a heavy uh, polyester resin tongue out of the head and is what actually punches holes in our artificial heads to actually do it with, with the alien's victims. What we're doing is uh, creating a, a false head. Uh, we'll tell you what we're doing each time. You might want to close your eyes now. <laughs> your ears? Uh. Head casting is a, is a, can be a, um, a frightening experience if you're claustrophobic. Uh, so we usually sit them down and explain the process. You'll feel the plaster bandage heating up through the alginate, but that's the normal part of the procedure. We use a, uh, a dental impression-making material called alginate, okay, which is then uh, reinforced with plaster bandage so that it holds its shape. And then we'll step away and let it completely harden, and then we'll uh, pop you out of this thing. Yeah, there you go. Good. Perfect. We can set them up on our rigs and you can graphically see the uh, blood flying and skull breaking and so on. It's a lot of fun, isn't it, yeah. Charles? Yeah. As well as defining the visual style of the Alien series, Ridley Scott and James Cameron each gave their movies a different personality. Action, come down. Now David Fincher is adding his unique signature. Fincher didn't really have the job yet. And he said, well, how do you feel about her being bald? This entire planet uh, that we're inhabiting is infested with lice. So people have to have their hair cut, extremely short if not shaved. I am bald anyway, so I probably just, just fit it into what he wanted. You get a different kind of respect around town, I tell you. I looked at one of the studio heads and I said, well, of course, if, I, if I'm bald, I have to get more money. <laughs> This part's too long. <laughs> I'd like A and B cameras on these, please. Can I see A and B? And action! David Fincher is a genius, basically, for whom I would jump off London Bridge. I trust him implicitly. I mean, I, work, I stand awestruck, actually, watching Fincher work. He is extraordinary. I don't know where a young guy w with such a, an instinct for scenes, where, where did he come from? I have no idea. I was really surprised. The issue is we use ourselves as bait. That's the thing that's missing. Okay. David uh, uh, comes from music videos, right? I mean, he did Madonna and, and um, other hot acts, um, as well as uh, some m magnificent commercials. No matter how tense things get and how overworked we are, et cetera, and how difficult things get, you can always crack jokes with David. It's a tough thing making a film like this, and Fincher's the only one who has laughed all the way through it. Action! Beyond the special effects and technical wizardry, the talent of the cast and the force of the story combined to transport the audience on another journey of pure, unmitigated terror. It's totally unlike, unlike the first two uh, in its approach, in its, in its uh, thrust, its focus. The great thing about films like this is what you don't see. It's the tiny little cut of the alien or something that happens which shocks everybody. They know it's going to happen, but they're never quite sure when it's going to happen. But we hope we're building up enough tension so that, uh, as I say, when we hit them, they're going to be frightened. This creature and, the, and, and what, he, what he wreaks in the theater makes it great as an experience for us. And the lights go down and you go, okay, take me away. Take me on a roller coaster ride to hell. It's not reality, it's a nightmare. Just really staring into the eyes of wife and dad. It's gonna be shocking because it is different. Fast and furious and rather dangerous. I just know that it's going to be absolutely terrifying. And um, that probably people are gonna miss a lot of it because they will be doing this.
case you forgot. <laughs> the bitch is back. It's here. We have no weapons of any kind. 